Josie Clark is home on the family farm for the weekend. What do you think about that? It's near Kempsey on the mid-north coast of New South Wales. She's a PhD student studying agronomy and is giving her dad, Glenn, advice on what he should and shouldn't plant to fatten the cattle. Personally, I probably wouldn't have planted millet because it doesn't put much weight on your cows, but um, rye would have been better. The family has farmed in this area for three generations, and for Glenn, agriculture has been his life. He also drove trucks to help support a family of four children. Until 2003, when he had an accident that almost claimed his life and changed his families forever. I remember getting woken up in the middle of the night to go to Sydney, which was very strange. And yeah, going to visit Dad in the hospital. And I guess, you know, you don't really recognise at the time that you, as a five-year-old kid, you were maybe saying goodbye to your dad. So, yeah, that was um, hard. Yeah, every day. Glenn's yeah. prognosis like was, was still was heartbreaking. Day, was like, well, there's no way. My first memory of it was waking up and looking out the window and seeing Sydney Harbour Bridge and wondering where I was. And, um, yeah, then the news was given to us that, yeah, I'd probably never walk again. He finally got to go home after nine months in hospital, undergoing extensive rehabilitation. I wasn't allowed back in the house until the bathroom modifications were done and I could access the house. So that was a pretty traumatic time. Well, it was all traumatic, you know, not for everyone, for the family and everyone. So we got all that sorted out and then it's time to think about what's the next plan. I was 41 at the time. So, yeah, never had a sick day. Oh, sorry. Never had a sick day in my life. And, um, yeah, we were just busy with four kids and pony club and work and everything else. And health net health is the last thing you think of. Nearly 20 years later, the emotions are still raw. But what it has done is open both their eyes to a greater issue. Josie, the youngest of the four, saw how determined her father was to get back to farming. We'll do that. Two years ago, she asked him a simple question that would transform her life and possibly the lives of Australians with a disability living in rural areas. It just came from a conversation we are having in the paddock one day. She said, oh, you know, is there a support network or, you know, anything like that where you can share thoughts and ideas? And I said, well, no, not really. So she started one launching Ability Agriculture on Facebook and Instagram. It's a place for Australians with a disability working in agriculture mm -hmm. to tell their stories. For me, it was just sunny to share the incredible stories of people working in agriculture with disability because there are incredible people working in our industry with disability and it's something we don't talk about. And I think there's so much power in just starting a conversation. Nigel Corish's story is just one of many Josie has shared. She's quite incredible. And also Born with cerebral palsy, Nigel grew up on a broad acre farm near the Queensland border town of Gundawindi. How did having cerebral palsy affect you growing up in the regions? The way I viewed it is that um, I didn't know any different. Um, so I was just a normal kid uh, growing up. It wasn't until I probably got to my teenage years where I started to fall behind at sport and just couldn't keep up uh, physically with my friends. And that was the first time I realised that uh, I had disability and it was going to affect me for the rest of my life. Nigel was an avid rugby player in his teens, but as he got older, found he could no longer keep up with his mates. Yeah. His disappointment in his body led him to be pretty down on himself. He says it took until he turned 30 to be able to accept himself and his condition. And one of the difficulties being disabled on the farm is uh, using a grease gun to uh, grease the grease nipples and the bearings of the machine. So basically just get the grease nipple onto there and you have to hold it there at the same time as you pump the grease in. So it ends up being quite difficult. And messy too. And very messy. So the worst thing you can do is get frustrated, get angry, and suddenly you can't do it at all. So just staying calm, staying patient, and just taking that extra longer bit to do it and 
pays dividends in the end. So Yeah, I suppose realising your limitations, but also knowing that you can overcome them to get the job done in the end. Absolutely. And this is a great example of if you are disabled and need help doing it, is uh, putting up your hand and getting someone to help you. And, um, that was something I was not very good at, particularly growing up. And as a young person, I would spend, you know, I could have spent two hours down a paddock just trying to adjust something small that someone with two hands could do in five minutes. But I was that uh, stubborn and arrogant that I wanted to do it myself. Got to nail it, get the screwdriver up underneath there. A bit of bush mechanics along the way helped. Growing up, I learned how to ride a quad bike early on in my life. But there was just only one problem. It wasn't very safe because I had to reach across and use across the right hand throttle with my left left hand. So because they're all yeah, right hand control. Right yeah. Good boy. When I was about 12 years old, uh, my father came up with the idea to modify the quad bike and uh, put the thumb throttle on the left hand side. And that was a game changer in my life. Just the fact that I could ride a mode bike with all my friends and completely gave me access uh, to the farm. So I would spend hours and hours just riding. Technology has improved life and work for rural people living with a disability. For Nigel and Glenn, machinery and vehicle modifications have given them independence and freedom and kept them on the farm. The car I got's a dual cab U, automatic and it's been modified for me to give me independence, which is a huge thing for me. So it's just had the hand controls adapted, like they're fitted by an engineer in Sydney. So yeah, I can get in that and throw my chair in the back. And when the kids were younger, be soccer and all that sort of thing, Friday night, good, the fun stuff. And um, yeah, with that gator there, well, I'd be lost without it. Like, it's just been modified. Um, with hand controls in it, and yeah, I can just, I can still contribute to the farm in any way that I, I possibly can. The tractor pretty much drives itself in the paddock with GPS, and I can solely focus on the control panel with my one hand and pretty well uh, do it quite easily. So, uh, technology's come a long way in agriculture to basically allow uh, disability people to uh, drive the tractors. Nigel praises the NDIS, which allows him to access physiotherapy services and specialised compression clothing in his hometown of Gundawindi. Minister for NDIS Bill Shorten acknowledges more can be done for rural and regional Australia. He's creating a new position to prioritise services for people with profound and severe disability living in regions so they don't have to move to the big cities. If we're spending $30 billion a year on the NDIS, that makes us say arguably a big dog in the debate. So what we need to do is to bark loudly on behalf of people with disability to go to equipment suppliers, to educate people that modifications actually increase productivity, increase choice, increase control. About two hours' drive west of Brisbane, Christy Banks lives on a property with her husband, Dale, and their two sons. Her story featured on the Ability Agriculture social media pages, recounting her dream job as a jockey. Started it when I was 15, riding in races, so it was a lot of, it was a lot of pressure for, you know, being so young, but it was what I wanted to do. I was an apprentice to my father until a race on New Year's Eve 2011 left her a paraplegic. It was just a normal day, rode in race one, jumped out of the barriers and went, you know, trying to pick up a position in the race and unfortunately clipped heels of the horse in front of me and fell. Um, I was fully conscious the whole time and, yeah, I just laid on the track and couldn't move my legs and going into Toowoomba Hospital um, and the doctor's telling me that I'll never walk again, yeah. Determined to keep her hospital stay as short as possible, Christy learnt the basics of life in a wheelchair in six weeks. In eight weeks, Christy enacted the old adage and got back on the horse. But it wasn't a great experience. With no grip from her legs, her body moved too much in the saddle and she had to be led around. 
Christy thought if that's what riding is like as a paraplegic, she wanted no part of it. So the thought of that option was gone. I just didn't think the speed would be anything I'd do again until I seen a girl, Amberly Snyder, in America riding with a seatbelt. And that was only about three or four or oh, about three or four months after my accident, and I seen that and I thought, well, I'm going to do that. With the support of husband Dale, a wheelchair that lifts, and a very special horse named Bob, riding is once again a joy for Christy. Let's watch Christy Banks right now, the very prime champion of the Great Ball. She's, been She's so confident on Bob the horse and extremely competitive. Christy is now a regular on the barrel racing circuit. I've won three 1D, that's the top level um, barrel racing titles. So, yeah, the fact that I'm as good as anyone on the horse and, you know, paralysed, I think is, I'm pretty happy with that. <laughs> Sport is often seen as a great way to get people to be involved in the disability community but it's not for everybody. There's not a lot out there for people who are on the land because when you're injured, you're either told you're going to play basketball or tennis or wheelchair rugby, but I was never a sports person before um, the injury and I thought, well, I don't think I'm going to be one now. <laughs> Eventually though, Glenn found a sport that gave him the freedom of movement he'd lost and an activity he could share with Josie. I went to Sydney here a while back. There's a respite place down there called Sargood, and you go there and they do different activities as far as um, like bike riding, canoeing, kayaking, snorkeling, all that sort of thing, and you have, um, you have support, full support, so you're not relying on family and friends. So I went down there and they had a hand cycle. So it's a three-wheel cycle, so we rode around the lake. And I love it. I just, if I don't ride every week, I've never been so passionate about some sport in all my life. <laughs> so it's just come along and it's just a feeling that you take on and you're not thinking about any of this. You're just, you're just one of the boys. You're just out there having a go. Oh, don't stop. People with disability who are deciding whether or not to stay involved in agriculture or even to stay in a rural area Josie encourages them to check out the Ability Agricultural social pages and take advice from the stories. I think Nigel said it best when he said, for a long time I felt like I was different and that he didn't really apply for things. And he said, just, just give it a go. He's like, the worst thing that someone can say is no, but the alternative is so much better. Are you feeling better now? Or? Don't discount someone because they have a disability. I think you'll find that they'll give you their heart and soul over everyone else. Thank you.